invite you to take out the little sermon summary sheet that's enclosed in your worship folder as well. That'll help you keep track of maybe where I'm going this morning. From this morning's epistle reading, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you think God likes you? We all want him to. We all hope that he does. However, do you sometimes wonder to yourself if God really truly likes you? Now, I can give you the answer. Sure he does. He loved you enough to send his son to die for you and for your sins and to be raised for your salvation. So, of course, God loves you. That's easy enough, right? Or I could be a little more pastoral. Point out that if you were to take John 3, 16 and 17 and personalize it, that God's word would sound like this. For God so loved me, insert your name here, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have Amen. everlasting life. For God did not send his son to me to condemn me, but in order that I might be saved through him. I can and I have. And I probably will remind you continually of what God says. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And I could continue to heap Bible passage upon Bible passage on you that would repeat the same thing that our text is telling us this morning. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yes, God likes you. He loves you. There, I've said it. We're good, right? Well, yeah, we've heard this before, and yeah, we've read the same words, Pastor, but I still sometimes wonder if God really likes me. Well, where does such a thought come from? If God's word repeatedly and consistently speaks of his unconditional agape love, grace, and mercy for us, why do we wonder whether or not he likes us? Look again at the first part of this morning's epistle reading. Paul says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, so that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and in all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is writing to a messed up, divided congregation whom he's going to challenge and admonish for the rest of this letter as well as a second letter he would later be faced to, forced to write. Yet he opens with the words, I give thanks to my God for you. Not because they're such great people, because hint, they're not. But because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Despite the failures and the shortcomings that he will soon enumerate and call them out on, Paul still gives thanks to the, for the Corinthians because of what God in his grace has done for them and in them. So at the end of the day, the question of whether God likes me or not rests on my heart, not his. God is faithful. That's a fact in Paul's mind. By whom? You were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God likes you. He likes you. He likes me. He loves you. And he so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is how God's love works. It flows out of his heart to us, unimpeded, 
by our sinful natures or our lack of righteousness. In this is love, the Bible tells us, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So where do our doubts and our fears, our guilt and our shame come from? Well, if you recall, a couple of weeks ago, I addressed the working of the Spirit who brings and encourages us in saving faith. And I shared how the devil tries to lead us astray. I pointed out that the devil cannot make things happen, nor can he make us react. Neither of those things are within his power. All he can do is mess with our minds. Look at the little chart on your sermon summary. Things happen in life. They are the events that take place in our life. They can be minor, they can be major, but they happen. And we respond to such events in the manner in which we process them in our minds. So A, an event takes place. B, we think through what has taken place. And C, we then respond to the event. How we think through the event determines how we respond. So, for example, you're running late to work, hurrying out your front door only to discover you have a flat tire. It happens, right? How do you respond? Someone might look at that flight flat, throw themselves a hissy fit and complain, why does this always happen to me? And then they proceed to have a meltdown in the front yard. While someone else may exact, experience the exact same thing, but they simply calmly and coolly change the flat and drive off to work. Both people experience the same event, a flat tire on their car as they were heading off to work. But their reactions were totally different. Why? Because of how they thought through the situation. You see, the victim reason, why does this always happen to me? Hey, if you got a flat tire in your driveway every week, shouldn't you do something about it? It's not something that happens. And yet the devil in the world has whispered into his ear, you're such a loser. Or, well, you know, God did this to you because you only put a buck in the plate when you should have given more. Or some other nonsense. And the response then becomes this emotional meltdown on their front steps. While the other person surveys the situation and surmises, well, life happens. Changes the flat and heads off to work. Again, the devil didn't flatten the tire. And the devil didn't make the first person have a meltdown. What the devil did was to suggest to that person that they were a victim of circumstance or maybe the object of a random prank from God. And the person bought into the lie and had an emotional meltdown in front of their house. You know, King David went through some tough times at the hands of his enemies, but he also suffered the consequences of his own sins and bad choices. Yet through thick and thin, he seemed to always come to the same conclusion, saying, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Now, it's not that God doesn't care whether we are sin or not. He does. His will and his way for us is once again summarized by Jesus' answer to the lawyer's question as stated in today's gospel. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And we see a very quick and pointed response from Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. God has a will and a way of life intended for his people to live accordingly. Love God, love others, repeat. God had rescued Israel from their Egyptian bondage and had led them out into the wilderness 
in order to prepare them for their entry into the promised land. And even while Moses was up on Mount Sinai receiving God's commandments and instructions from the Lord himself, the people busily erected a golden calf idol and worshipped it. And neither God nor Moses were too pleased at the spectacle. In fact, Moses comes charging down the hill, throws the tablets down, breaks them into pieces, and then leads the Levites as they kill 3,000 people for refusing to repent of their idolatry. Later, when the people came to the borders of what was meant to be their new home, they refused to trust God's leading and to enter into the land. And so God had Moses just lead them right on back out in the wilderness until they all died off and a whole new generation of Israel arose. This morning's Old Testament reading records for us Moses' words to that next generation. He asked them, What does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear your Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good, and then he goes on and he tells them, He is your praise. He is your God. Who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen? Your fathers went down to Egypt 70 persons. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. You see, both God's will and his blessings flow from his great love for us. He sees and he hears our deeds and our words, at times with a smile when we get it, at times with a grimace when we don't. But God's love is in the Hebrew chesed, that is a steadfast love, that loves us because that's what God wants to do, not because of what we do or despite what we don't do. That's grace, loving the unlovable even as they do the dastardly and the despicable. It's not that God doesn't care, it's because God chooses to forgive. And that choice comes at a dear price, as the Bible tells us, Christ himself bore our sins in his body on a tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. But it was a price God was willing to pay. And thus Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. God not only likes you, he truly, dearly, and especially loves you. This we know for the Bible tells us so. The Bible is replete with reminders of his steadfast love. God constantly reminds us in his word that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. You are like, you are loved, for God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if that's good news for you today, why not share it with someone else who may be struggling in their relationship with the Lord sometime this week? I mean, blessed to be a blessing by God, it's what we've been called to do, right? Love God. Love others. Repeat. And all God's people said. Please rise.